everyone and welcome. I'm Susan Poisson Locke and I'm an artist, writer and director of the Decolonising Arts Institute at the University of the Arts London, UAL. To give you some background, the UAL Decolonising Arts Institute has been in development since late 2018 and is currently in pilot phase. Conceived as a decentered, porous and evolving space, the Institute seeks to challenge colonial histories and imperial legacies, to recognise past and ongoing work, and to drive cultural, social and institutional change through practice and research, artistic, art historical, curatorial, museological and pedagogic. The past year has been focused on setting up the Institute with a small core team and developing various pilot projects and partnerships we remain very much in formation. In summer 2019, we were awarded British Art Network funding to develop a seminar series under the rubric Decolonising British Art, Decentering, Resituating and Reviewing Artworks and Collections. Originally planned to, to take place as live events in May and June this year, we have evidently had to adapt for online in response to the pandemic. Moreover, the resurgence of Black Lives Matter has underscored the need for cultural institutions to address enduring structural inequalities and to commit not just words, but actions to bring about change. Collections matter for the artists and artworks they remember or forget and for the stories they tell or hide. And actions to bring about change may not always be large, loud or immediately visible, but also small, quiet, steady and slow. The Decolonising British Art Seminar Series is developed in partnership with MIMA, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, Birmingham Museums Trust, INNOVA, Institute of International Visual Art, and the Arts Council Collection, British Council Collection and Government Art Collection. The series aims to explore recent and historical exhibition practices, curatorial strategies and artistic interventions and provocations for decentering, resituating and reviewing artworks and collections. Last week we had our first two seminars. The first was with MIMA, which explored objects of attention and the question of how an object centred approach can resituate artworks and collections. And the discussion foregrounded the mutual care and time needed to develop a meaningful collaboration between researchers and curators that was genuinely open, critical and generative, illuminating institutional oversights and bringing about pragmatic changes to habits and approaches to curating, interpreting and display. The second seminar was with the Arts Council Collection, British Council Collection, and Government Art Collection, which explored curatorial and artistic perspectives on decentering collections. And this conversation picked up on the question of care and notions of value in terms of what it means to care for artists as well as artworks in collections, how collections attempt to center or decenter particular narratives of art and artists, especially in relation to nation, and what are the discourses and mechanisms the privileges and relations that permit value to be assigned or withheld. Today, the third seminar in the series takes place in partnership with Birmingham Museums Trust, looking at experimental approaches towards decolonizing the museum through the lens and legacy of the 2017 exhibition, The Past Is Now. In addition to notions of nation, we're likely to pick up on another question raised last week. What does it mean for an institution to bring in or invite in other voices? And this is, of course, a question of power. The fourth and final seminar will take place tomorrow with Innova, which will revisit the 2003 exhibition Veil to consider curatorial and artistic strategies and the relevance of the exhibition today, closing with a conversation between myself and Sapake Anjiyama as directors charged with visioning or revisioning institutes. 
My role from this point on is very much behind the scenes and I'll just share a few links and access notes before I introduce and hand over to Gaylene Gould, who will be moderating the seminar today. So in the top left hand corner of your live stream window, the menu icon will take you to some organizational and artists links. And to the right of your live stream is a Q&A window. Please do type any questions you have into the box here and we'll feed as many of these into the conversations as we can later. Unfortunately, the closed captions function isn't available, but we do aim to add captions and BSL interpretation to the edited live stream recordings later and we'll let everyone know when these, became, uh, when these become available on the UAL YouTube channel. So now to introduce Gaylene, who may be familiar to you for many reasons. Gaylene Gould is a creative director and consultant who designs interactive arts projects and spaces. Her projects have been commissioned by and performed at the Tate, BNA, Arts Catalyst, Vivid Projects, Selfridges, H Club, Moderna Music, Sweden and BAM New York. She's currently curating Brilliant Roots for Claw Leadership a support space for Black, Asian and ethnically diverse cultural leaders. And Gaylene is also an arts broadcaster for the BBC, uh, as well as a published fiction writer, a cultural reviewer and a cultural ambassador for London, appointed by Mayor Sadiq Khan. Over to you, Gaylene. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, really, really good to be back and excited by today's seminar which will explore practical approaches to challenging colonialism embedded in museum practice. It's focusing on the formative 2017 exhibition, The Past Is Now, Birmingham and the British Empire at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. The session will explore the ongoing research arising from the project, sharing reflections on curatorial strategies, artistic interventions and institutional change. Today's session is gonna be in two parts. The first is focusing on institutional positionings and curatorial strategies, and we're going to hear from Janine Easton, Rebecca Bridgman and Rachel Minot. We're then going to have some time for discussion and a Q&A and a short comfort break. So the Q&A uh, function that Susan mentioned, so I'm going to give you little bits of moments throughout just so that you can actually put your questions in there because it does go fast and it's quite hard to listen and to write at the same time. So I'll try and give you a lot of this space, but um, there's gonna be two Q and A uh, moments. So it'd be really great to hear from you in, the, in that, that section, those sections. The second part of the session will focus on artist interventions and provocations within and in response to collections. And we'll be hearing from three artists, Sarah Maple, Fadwa Maladina and Keith Piper. So let's begin with institutional positionings. We're going to start with Janine Eason, who's Director of Engagement, and Rebecca Bridgman, who's the Curatorial and Exhibitions Manager, uh, both at the Muse Birmingham Museum Trust. They're going to talk about the context and development of the exhibition project, The Past Is Now, Birmingham and the British Empire, which took place in 2017 to 2018, and also the related ongoing research. So I'll hand over to both of those two now. Okay, thank you very much, Gaylene. Absolutely, I'm really pleased to, to be here. So um, I'm going to give you um, the context, really, first of all, to the past is now, um, both in terms of BMT's operational um, position, but also the context of working in such a young, super diverse city of Birmingham. I should remind everyone that the past is now is actually quite an old project now. It took place four years ago. And so what I want to do is talk a bit about the legacy of this project um, and more recent work that we've been doing to bring some new diverse narratives into, the mu into our museums. And then after I've spoken, I'll then hand over to Rebecca to talk in more detail about the Past Is Now project itself. Uh, next slide, please, Rebecca. So uh, uh, just to begin, I'll firstly give you a really quick introduction to Birmingham Museums Trust. Um, it's one of the largest museums trusts in the UK. It was set up in 2012 as an educational charity and education is part of our charitable object and lies very much at the heart of all of our activity. We manage a portfolio of nine very diverse museums and historic properties across the city. And these include the two main city centre venues of Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery and Think Tank, which is Birmingham Science Museum, 
but also a wide range of different historic houses um, throughout the city's communities. In a normal year, uh, we'd attract around 1 million visitors to our museums and last year, a further 9.7 million people across the world um, engaged with the collection through our loans programme. And our vision is to reflect Birmingham to the world and the world to Birmingham. And our commitment to decolonising the collection very much complements this vision. Next slide, please. The Birmingham Museums curates a collection of over one million items with objects and specimens from all corners of the world that span art and design, human history, science and industry and natural science. And much of this large civic collection was acquired before the mid 20th century. And so it doesn't necessarily reflect the lives of people who now live and work um, in the diverse city of Birmingham that, it, that it's since become. And it's one of our main priorities to develop the collection through collaboration with people in the city to not only better reflect their histories, but in doing so, um, begin to change the external perceptions of the organisation itself. Next slide, please. So we, what we're doing is seeking to become more aware of and to present the museum's historic roots in the British Empire. Um, when Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery first opened back in 1885, it was at the heart of the civic and cultural centre of the city driven to completion largely through the vision then of the Liberal leader, um, Joseph Chamberlain. Joseph Chamberlain was also the Secretary of State for the Colonies. He actively promoted the expansion of the British Empire in Asia, Africa and the West Indies and had major responsibilities for causing the Second Boer War in South Africa. Birmingham's global historical context and the museum collection we hold is therefore rooted very much in the British Empire. And that history of empire incorporates all Birmingham communities from the 19th century white working classes whose manual labour powered the city's industries to recent migrants from Commonwealth countries. Next slide, please. Today, Birmingham's diverse population is a lasting connection to the city's imperial past. In the 21st century, one in 10 Brummies were born in a Commonwealth country. It is the most ethnically diverse city in Britain outside London, with well over 40% of the population are from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. And by 2024, Birmingham is believed to become the second plural city where no ethnic um, ethnicity forms the majority. Birmingham also has the youngest population of any major city in Europe, um, with around 400,000 people under the age of 30 living in the city. And that diversity of population brings a great vibrancy of culture to the city in everyday life from faith to food, fashion and music. And such diversity is, is often celebrated, but the related historical um, traumas brought through British colonial past must be acknowledged and shared. Next slide, please. So Birmingham Museums has um, actually a long reputation of working closely with audiences, but there's been an important step change in the organisation since it became a charity back in 2012. During that time, we've gone from being an organisation for whom audience and community engagement and participation might be an element of an exhibition project to actually now a culture where community engagement and co-production is at the heart of everything we do. And I think it's important to recognise that the past is now was one of a number of different and interrelated co-curation projects, including the Faith in Birmingham um, gallery um, there on the bottom left, and also the Collecting Birmingham project on the, um, all that were all delivered around about the same time. <clears throat> and at the top of the slide there, you can see a banner that was acquired through Collecting Birmingham. Um, it sums up why we were collecting, to give people a voice and discover what matters to them, alongside gallery views of faith in Birmingham and the past is now. Objects acquired through Collecting Birmingham are displayed in Faith in Birmingham Gallery. And without the community networks, 
established through the Collecting Birmingham project, we probably wouldn't have been possible to find the activist co-curators that we work with on the past is now. So it's all very much in interrelated. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I want to say a little bit more now about that Collecting Birmingham project. Um, this was one of BMT's larger programmes of work running from 2015 to 18, which has shaped our longer term collections development policy. The project's aims were to create stronger connections to our local communities, create meaningful and lasting relationships with people who live and work in, in the city of Birmingham and to develop the collection with objects and stories that have resonance to people in Birmingham today. Most importantly, it was an engagement-led project, engagement-led collecting project, building on our existing community relationships, but also expanding our reach deeper into communities that we hadn't worked with before. And the project was significant in supporting cultural change, embedding new ways of working internally and externally and resulting in a shift in the demographic of the profile of our visitors to our museums. And since then, BMT has moved away from a purely curatorial led acquisition policy to one which puts audiences and communities and engagement with them at its heart. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to share with you this, this great quote from um, Charlotte Holmes, who worked on the Collecting Birmingham project. And I, I think it really shows a shift in mindset about our approach to collecting. I think because to make lasting connections, build trust, relevance and resonance with the museum and the collections. The question we must ask of ourselves is not what should we put in the museum, but who should we put in the museum? We need to find ways of telling different stories and histories about the collection. These histories are often hidden and maybe painful to share, but our museums must become safe spaces where these histories can be told and explored. These are not our stories, but they are the stories of the communities of Birmingham. Next slide, please. Don't Settle is a more recent project we're involved with that takes learning from the past is now. It's a partnership project that empowers young people of colour from Birmingham and the Black Country to change the voice of heritage. It's all about changing who tells the stories about history and it shifts the decision making about what stories are told in our museums from museum staff to young people of colour. And through this programme, described as an activist programme, Young people have reimagined Soho House, the Georgian home of the industrialist Matthew Bolton, which stands in Handsworth, and where the history is presented were tr traditionally centred around Bolton's legacy as a businessman and innovator. So instead, the young creators developed new displays and a tour which told the stories of innovation within the diverse communities of Handsworth today in order to bridge the gap that exists between the house and the community it sits in. And also at Aston Hall, a Jacobean manor, uh, a different group of young curators are reinterpreting the, the boudoir room there with radical displays exploring themes of social injustice in the fashion industry. Next slide, please. So my last slide before I hand over to Rebecca, um, this is um, a recent photographic acquisition by leading photographer Vanley Burke from his Rivers of Birmingham series which narrates the lives of people in the city since the 1960s, and it was actually acquired through the Collecting Birmingham project. So looking forward, um, Birmingham Museums Trust recognises the importance of diversifying its workforce if it has any hope of truly connecting with and reflecting the people of the city it serves. Alongside this, the need and urgency to involve others outside the organisation um, to research, reinterpret and represent the collection through different lenses that focus on untold narratives. And Birmingham hosts the Commonwealth Games in 2022. This is a unique opportunity for Birmingham to showcase itself as a global city, but it's also a very controversial event, given that the Commonwealth is a legacy of the British Empire. So in our plans for the programme, we do not want to shy away from this. We want want to have a, an honest acknowledgement of the Commonwealth as a legacy of empire, 
and to explore narratives that connect people to their place in the world. Okay, thank you. Over to you now, Rebecca. Thanks, Janine. So as Janine said, um, I just want to um, kind of present the past is now and give you some more detail on that project. Um, so the past is now Birmingham and the British Empire, or TEPIN as it is often referred to internally, was a cross collections display that was opened between October 2017 and June 2019, sorry, June 2018 at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. It presented Birmingham's collection, the city's history and legacy in its imperial context. Interpretation was very much non-neutral, presenting that collection and the history it narrates through a, through a decolonial lens, which foregrounded the trauma associated with the city's imperial past. It was, and remains today, a radical game changer for Birmingham museums. I was one of the white curators, permanent museum employees who worked on this project. This was, and still is, the big elephant in the room. As some might say, by taking part in the project, I was mimicking the very colonial structures any decolonizing project might seek to dismantle. Um, members of permanent staff worked as part of a project team led by Sarah Wajid, who you can see in this photograph on the second on the right, who was then Birmingham Museum's Arts Council change maker. And we're delighted to say that she'll shortly rejoin us to become our new CEO alongside Zach Menser. Rachel Minot, who is speaking after this, but isn't in the picture, was the project's research assistant and part of the curatorial team during this and, sub uh, during this and a subsequent project. But the display couldn't have been realised without a group of external co-curators, six well-informed local activists, external to the museum, all women of colour, who were and still are vocal in their disappointment and criticism of museums. Four of them are pictured um, in this slide. So from left to right, Abira Kamran, Shaheen Kamani, Alia Hasina and Samaya Kasim and not in the picture, Mariam, Mariam Khan and Sarah Myers. They worked with us from the outset of the project to select the themes and objects and to develop the design and interpretation of the display. Um, as the display no longer physically exists and we're doing this on Zoom, um, I wanted to start with a visual overview. The display incorporated six thematic sections that are listed here that are some of the many stories of Birmingham and the British Empire. In this slide, you can see the introductory panel on, um, alongside the section on eugenics that included two artworks by Marguerite Millwood, a 20th century sculptor who trained in Birmingham and subsequently made busts of racial types that she encountered on her travels through Africa. This image gives an overview of the look and feel of the display, including much of the fine art incorporating sculpture, a sculpture entitled Land of Milk and Honey 2 by Donald Rodney, and a hang of 2D works by artists from John Frederick Lewis and Dante Gabriel Rossetti to Van Lee Burke and Barbara Walker and Keith Piper. Um, that artwork was grouped in a section that focused on representation that you can see here alongside the introductory paragraph on the panel for that section written by the co-curators. Below is an image of the section on environment that included objects from worked ivory to mahogany long case clock. And to the left is the introductory paragraph on, that, on the panel for that section, again, written by the co-curators. Here you can see the section on Kenyan independence and a painting by William Gear created during the so-called Mamau uprising and depicting the Kenyan jungle through the eyes of a young British national serviceman. And below is an interactive panel in the gallery which allowed visitors to write comments and respond to provocations because we very much wanted the gallery to be, space, to be a space um, of discussion and debate. So now I'm going to move on to discuss two of the sections in a bit more detail. Um, returning to Joseph Chamberlain that um, Janine al already kind of introduced, who was elected the town's mayor in 1873 and is often portrayed as the benevolent founding father of the Museum and Art Gallery and of the university. But what is much less discussed is his subsequent appointment as colonial secretary to the British government and his actions 
for example, during the Boer War in South Africa. Here you can see two images of Chamberlain from Birmingham's collection, a portrait painted posthumously in 1937 by Oswald Burley, and the other is a image is a postcard representing Chamberlain as colonial secretary, satirizing the standoff between him and Paul Kruger, the president of the South African Republic. The portrait on the left was displayed in the Museum and Art Gallery's Birmingham History section, which opened in 2012, and the postcard was included in the Teepin display. But these two objects very much encapsulate the shift of our interpretation of Chamberlain. Um, this slide shows interpretation um, in the Birmingham History Galleries below in black and that written by the co-curators for the Teepin display above in blue. The Teepin section panel represents Chamberlain as colonial secretary from a non-neutral stance. And in contrast, the text from Birmingham History Galleries attempts what could be seen as neutrality and certainly presents a less emotive perspective. Following the closure of Teepin, um, the panel um, on Chamberlain as colonial secretary is now located in the Birmingham History Galleries alongside the older display, and as such is really a lasting legacy of the Teepin project. And certainly going forward, we will be interpreting Chamberlain in this broader context. And we've now been working with the University of Birmingham on revising interpretation of Chamberlain, and this work has the potential to impact on a citywide basis. Um, here you can see um, the section on Indian independence, with narrative focusing on the horrific events triggered by the partition of India in August, in August 1947, brought about by the end of British colonial rule. The display, as you can see, included 19th century decorative art objects representing Muslim, Hindu and Sikh communities, alongside a 20th century Epstein bust of the Bengali poet Tagore. Um, and I wanted to show this slide, although it's very busy, um, because interpretation was one of the biggest challenges of the project. It was a point of contention and disagreement with the co-curators and raised many questions about editorial control, power and authority. Essentially, who should have the final say on what goes in the gallery text? Um, and this slide illustrates what I now think of the editing triangle in which curators, co-curators and academics contributed to what became the final version of text for the section on Indian independence. And there are three different kind of evolving versions of that text you can see here. On the far left is the first draft written by me following a session um, which discussed text content with the co-curators. And this version adhered to our then in institutional interpretation guidelines in terms of word count and reading age, and also included a quote from one of the co-curators. In the centre, there is a draft written by the co-curators in response to my draft. This is longer, more nuanced, less neutral, and with a higher reading age. And then on the far left is the finalised version that incorporated comments from Dr Manu Segal, an academic from University of Birmingham who specialises in histories of colonial South Asia. Um, the differences between the text are highlighted in red and the numbered points show particularly striking divergences. And I just want to summarise a couple of those here. So in terms of points one and two, they indicate the greater complexity in sentence structure in the co-curator's texts. The co-curators didn't want what they saw as a dumbed-down version and wanted to ensure their text was taken seriously. Um, points three and four are changes suggested by Dr. Segal, who felt that we shouldn't oversimplify complex histories of the relationships between Hindu, Sikhs and Muslims in South Asia, and that, which, and that, and that we should emphasise the impact of Britain's departure as something, as a legacy to, that's something that has, still has a legacy today. And then I just want to um, wrap up by touching on responses and legacies of the display. The audience response was overwhelmingly positive, particularly from the, from the young diverse communities in Birmingham, as you can see from the Twitter response on the right and the figures above it. 
The only really significant complaint resulted in this article in the Times, where various sections of the text were paraphrased to conclude that we had represented the British Empire as evil. Um, from an organisational perspective, I think we should recognise. I think we recognise that T the Teepin project was far from perfect. Mistakes were made um, and have been learnt from. But what remains is a project um, that, through its challenges, generated learning. And the impact and legacy of that learning has transformed the organisational ethos and mindset, together with the other projects that Janine talked about in her slides. From a personal perspective, I feel that Teepin was a turning point in my career. In my opinion, you can read about histories and processes in books or articles, or listen to talks detailing other people's works and experiences, but nothing can ever replace the doing of a decolonizing project of working with others collaboratively to build a new mindset, not only in terms of interpreting collections, but more broadly in terms of your understanding of history and your place within that history. Going forward, I think it's really important that alongside other colleagues, white museum staff get more involved in this debate instead of shying away from it. So that the onus is not only on external co-curators or staff who are people of color to be the torchbearers, because surely everybody has a responsibility to be an agent of change and to address the, the traumas of our imperial past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janine and Rebecca. What I'd love to do now is to give people time, just a minute to post any questions. You can, you can see the Q and A bit on your screen. So, um, and um, we can have a little, a quiet moment to digest. There's some really, really interesting uh, uh, awarenesses and experiences that came through this from, from the museum's point of view. So just give you a minute just to write any questions. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to your responses. I had, I had plenty of questions um, from that. Uh, but it'd be really great. Now we're going to see this from uh, someone who was involved in the uh, of this exhibition as a research assistant. This is Rachel Minot, artist, curator and a researcher, trustee of the Museums Association, where she is the chair of their Decolonising Guidance Working Group. Great Rachel is now going to reflect on the exhibition and co-curation process in light of the changing discourse around decolonising culture, education and more. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon and thank you all for having me here today at the Decolonizing British Arts Seminar. I'm so pleased to join Rebecca and Janine and of course Gaylene in this session. It's lovely to see you all and I'm heartened by this digital connection during uncertain times. I hope my contribution today will be useful and provocate some discussion later in the Q&A. And I want to use my time here to reflect on the process of the past is now with some distance to contextualize it within our changing world, but also some of my evolving thinking around decolonial practice and the responsibility of heritage organizations and workers to take up this call. While my thinking and reading about decolonizing was by no means began, nor did it end with this exhibition, the impact of living through this process affected my understanding of what had been, to me at the time, a theoretical exercise in regards to its practical applications. Through co-curating this exhibition, having visitors respond to the work we did, and then upon reacting and reflecting with colleagues and my peers, my understanding and feelings towards decolonial practice was significantly developed. I remember knowing that working on this project was an opportunity that I could not pass up, even though at the time it meant commun commuting between Norwich and Birmingham while finishing my master's program and dissertation and sleeping in hostels for the first few weeks of this role. The aim of the exhibition was to tell the story of the British Empire from the perspective of the colonized by working collaboratively and shifting the perspectives in the center of the narrative. This was always going to be an experiment in decolonizing but owning the term with confidence in a British museum was not something I had been seen, I had seen done before. Having spoken about this exhibition from a number of angles since it was completed, I've had a lot of time to reflect on what this exhibition tried to achieve 
its successes, and some of its failures. In many ways, that which made it successful, I believe, were the result of its failures. The tensions of the project, the power struggles, the replicated violences, the short time frame we worked within to pull this display together, created the feeling of a lightning in a bottle moment, of a captured moment full of emotion and information, sharp tongued and with little euphemism, jam packed with stories because we couldn't or wouldn't edit it down further to fit our exhibition best practice, meant that while it was a single room, it demanded time and repeated visits. It felt polyvocal because there were so many and perhaps too many contributors and visionaries. But it was beautiful. It was full of art and heritage objects placed together in unexpected ways. It was full of images of people of color from across the world and over a long period of time. Nuanced, complex representations laid next to flatter, more idealized or minimized representations. It was subject driven rather than object driven as good decolonial practice should be. It was about people and it was about acknowledging pain as a part of the process of recognition and reconciliation, even though it did not take the viewer, nor I believe the co-curators to the latter. We curated the passes now to the backdrop of the Brexit referendum in 2016, Donald Trump's US presidential election in 2016, the Grenfell Tower fire of June 2017, and the premiership of Theresa May. This context around creating the passes now for me was all about uncertainty, pain and change. The realities of the EU referendum were settling in and the divisive narrative around British identity called simultaneously for decolonial thinking with a mind for inclusion and narrative of globalized citizens that was not distinct from, nor was it wholly connected at the time to our ecological responsibilities. On the other hand, there was a call for decolonial practice that was rooted in nationalism and smaller states, localized power and self-determination that was being painted with a broad brush of racism and intolerance. Both versions carried a deep sense of distrust for the state and the systems of power, but also challenged the idea of truth and authority and, and the authority of sources of information. Post-truth was emerging as a reality in which we were now living. While terrifying in many ways, it was also a tool to challenge singular narratives. The civic responsibility of heritage organizations in showing complex narratives and brought to question the value we placed on information and expertise. But soon after the exhibition was completed, the narrative and the place of museums within this debate kept changing. Black Panther entered the zeitgeist in 2018. However, with the scene where now infamously the character Elka Ki Eric Killmonger kills a white curator to steal back, as he frames it, a Wakandan artifact on display, received whoops and cheers in a cinema populated by a largely black audience. You were able to read that this was a long held viewed of colonial cultural theft and a sense of poetic justice being acted out, but also a new impatience that would mark the next three years of this discourse. And in many ways felt as though it reached a if not the climax in the toppling of Edward Colston statue in Bristol this year. So I want to take a moment to zone in for, um, to one element of the exhibition that passes now, the Kenyan independence story shown here, which luckily Rebecca also gave some context for. This story used artistic expression impressions that at first seem relatively harmless due to the abstract nature um, but showed prejudices when one read the artist's explanation and framing of, you know, perception of these Kenyan soldiers in the jungle from a British soldier's point of view. Um, the, dis the display used evidence in the form of archival material showcasing the words of the person's responsibility responsible for the collection of the artifacts held in the museum, along with the display of weapons and further interpretation. The point of the display was to ask the question of fair representation in a museum collection when those who control the narrative um, view those who they are depicting in a certain way informed by prejudice. At the time, I viewed this as one of the most successful elements of the exhibition, and I am quite proud of how cleverly curated I felt it was. 
but the element got a lot of resistance and I spent a large amount of time in the gallery debating this cho the choices and the limiting framing of a complex narrative. I think there can be similar critiques levied at the Indian independence narrative, both of which could have used at least a room to extract and make accessible the nuances of the multiple forces at play in these stories. In my thinking as it stands today, I would say that this element of the exhibition is actively anti-racist, but not entirely successful as decolonial. And that is because the voices present are still those of the white players with power. It centers pain and discrimination. It contradicts that discrimination and exposes it in this anti-racist attempt. But the center of the narrative is not the Kenyans or the Kikiyu, not their motivations, nor their words, nor even really images of them. It was curated, it wasn't created in consultation with Kenyans in the diaspora or at home. And the element of reconciliation that is missing in the gallery as a whole meant that this display is stuck in anger rather than healing. Now I've said this before elsewhere and I will reiterate it here today. I don't know if we were at a point as, an, in a, as a nation where we could have been showcasing this nuance or aiming for reconciliation in such a small space. The energy in that project was about responding to misrepresentation, absent representation, and the dehumanizing effect that sustained lack of recognition had and the violence, violences against black and brown bodies it perpetuated. The past is now was one exhibition in one room. It was successful in, to be successful, it needed to be a part of a series of investigations and articulations. It needed a version that explored one of the early ideas that were shared by Samai Kasim of the impact of fantasy, of the fantasy of empire, to have narratives that were subject rich, female, non-binary, trans, queer, ones that centered healing and mental health, that explored intergenerational experiences, ones that talked about migrated bodies and migrated objects, contextualized current events more closely, ones that centered protest and, vo and voices in the words of the protesters, ones that felt like a conversation rather than a speech, and ones that were curated through a happy process with no pain and only encouragement, enrichment, belonging, and mutual understanding. And in many ways, at certain points, the past has now had some of that context through the extended exhibition programming of the Knights of the Raj display and the Coming Out Arts Council collection exhibition with the questions around repatriation, but with questions around repatriation, colonial comm commemoration and memorialization in the public sphere, the implications of systemic racism on whether people live or die, all coming into the popular consciousness now and being laid out as a culture war, garnering so much attention, passion and discourse. The ideas around risk that limited engagement in the topics before is much higher, but so is the appetite for this complex and nuanced engagements. And they need to be continually placed within these further contexts of power, privilege, and discrimination. After the passes now, I collaboratively curated a follow-up exhibition, Within and Without Body Image and the Self, through which I tried to rectify some of the mistakes we made in the process of approaching co-curation in the passes now. In many ways, Within and Without executed a version of collaboration and decolonial practice that is truer to my understanding of the word. But we didn't use the word in marketing, nor discussion around the display. And without the star power and the energy of Sar Wajid, it never really made the public impact that Tiefen did. And perhaps the happy process made it a little less successful as an exhibition. But the magic moments that made Tiefen so wonderful for me, such as walking around the space in an intergenerational group of women of color, and then at the salon hang, looking towards the words of Audrey Lord and Malcolm X, where we had to sit down and hold hands, emotional because we felt seen and spoken to. These moments did also occur in the Within and Without exhibition, where collaborators reinterpreted images of the pre raphaelite collection because they felt that it was the first time they had seen their body represented publicly um, as a trans individual or being told that a conference that a lecturer at the University of Birmingham took their first year medical students to within and without to get them to give them a better understanding of the diversity of bodies 
and challenging the concept of binaries that he felt were very poisonous um, to them as medical students. The smaller impact of within and without may have happened for a number of reasons, but my reflection upon it does ask that we remember that decolonizing, while now in the popular consciousness, on the tips of the tongues of funders and large organizations, edgy because it's out of favor by the government, that decolonizing is not the word. It is human-centered, creative, decentralizing, democratizing practice. We must get better at we must get better at identifying it when it is not labeled because it has been and will continue to be authentic when it is an action and a way of behaving and not a word. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for that. Um, okay, so we've now got some time, about 20 minutes for questions for uh, Janine, for Rachel, for Rebecca. So if you have any, do uh, continue to post um, in, the, in the chat. So not in the chat, in your Q&A section. So I'm gonna go, we've already got a few, so I'm gonna go straight to the audience questions. Uh, this one, I guess, is for um, uh, the Birmingham Museum reps. How many of the lessons learned were written into policy, strategy, and good practice? And, and I don't know whether there's something you know specific you can speak to on that, or yeah, good to hear your reflections. Yeah, I can perhaps start. Um, I think it's definitely um, reflected in our ongoing practice. I think it's just building really on what. Um, Rachel said at, at, at the end there about, um, you know, democratizing our, our work, I think is the, for me, is the thing that um, has continued very much, not only at the Museum and Art Gallery, actually, in the displays that are not, not actually only relating to decolonizing the, the narratives and, and the collection, but actually, you know, involving communities and people much more in, in deciding on, um, and uh, you know, developing our content, you know, right, right from working with children under the age of eight at Think Tank on designing a new mini museum for the display there. You know, I think it's that sort of, for me, it's that democratization, democratizing work that we, that is, is becoming embedded in our practice. Um, whether that's yet written into our, formally written into our policies and strategy, I think is a really interesting question because I think, you know, what we, perhaps haven't yet done fully as an organization since the past is now, is reflect on those um, guiding documents. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got, as um, Rebecca mentioned, we've got Sarah Wajid now joining as a co-CEO, and I'm sure that work will now, will now um, sort of begin. We've sort of almost been too busy practicing <laughs> to reflect and build it into our written documents. I don't know. Rebecca, you want to say a bit more though about the collecting policy because that yeah, that I suppose that is that that is the the one example I think um, of of something of a concrete kind of you know um, output of 
um, TPIN that is a part of the collection development policy. And I think it's an outcome very much of collecting Birmingham and the other projects that that Janine discussed as well. So our collections development policy now includes a collecting theme around context and connections, which is basically about the fact that Birmingham's history is rooted in empire, recognising that history, recognising the traumas associated with that history and recognising the need to collect more broadly um, by artists, uh, in terms of artists, um, artworks and objects that are associated with the Commonwealth and kind of link the diverse communities of Birmingham um, to the kind of to their to their roots across the Commonwealth and across the empire. So that I think one thing about Teepin was that we sometimes struggled to have collections that could narrate those histories of empire. And, and that is sort of really to to kind of um, mm. face up to that and and address that situation. Mm. There's a question, thank you. There's a question from Robert Wenley, which I'd like, if you don't mind, Robert, I'd like to do an addition, additionally, additional addition to, additional addition to. Uh, Robert says, who has the ultimate authority when decolonizing collections and interpretation? And the bit that I think is quite interesting is around, I think it was um, in an article that you wrote, Rachel, about uh, this exhibition, where you says that this concept of neutrality which is fascinating. And also you spoke to this as well, uh, Rebecca, when you gave us that fascinating breakdown of how interpretation of uh, the Indian independence, the, the piece changed and, and the Joseph Chamberlain piece changed. And I, I'm really fascinated by this concept of neutrality within um, museum practice. And I'm interesting how has that shifted? Has your concept of that shifted through doing the work that you've been doing in this particular and also Rachel to hear about your perspective of um, whether neutrality is even ever ever possible. Um, so I don't really believe that neutrality is possible um, because there's so much that frames our understanding of neutrality that 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 even if we believe it's it is informed and neutral it is informed by our lived experiences and the perspectives that we are um, able to take part in um, and especially in institutions and or and um, such as museums that are predominantly white they can never truly be neutral because their neutrality starts from that point of whiteness um, and so for a lot of people it will feel ultimately political um, if they don't if they don't if they're not as close to that whiteness or that sense of neutrality um, and it goes for a lot of other marginalized narratives too, um, which is why decolonizing cannot forget that it has to be anti-ableist, has to challenge heteronormativity um, and the patriarchy and, and all those other forms of kind of powers and structures of privilege. Yeah. When it comes to the ultimate authority in terms of this project and larger, it is essential that when working in a new or on a new project, or but definitely with a new set of collaborators, that you decide how you want to work and who wants to take on which role. Because you could project that in a ideal decolonial world, the white curators would not have the final say on the interpretation. But in reality, the group that you're working with might say, I don't want to give you that labor of doing that last bit that that kind of struggle and the fight over the ands and the commas. I want you to listen to me and I want you to interpret it, but in the most authentic way that you can, kind of tapping into the emotional resonance. So one decolonial approach would not work from all across different um, groups because each of those groups will have a different understanding of the power they want to hold and the energy they want to share in that project space. Um, within the past is now we did not create that agreement at the beginning, which is one of the reasons we had some of that. Um, we didn't have a, as granular an agreement in the beginning. So that's why we had some of that pushback. And in the end, we decided that the, the co-curators, the external participants, because they wanted to provide that much labor, would have the ultimate authority, but that we would also acknowledge that our experience as museum workers was about legibility and accessibility in a public space. And we were going to use that to try and make sure we didn't edit the content or the emotion, but that we would still try to make 
that a clear piece of writing that as many people as possible could read. Mm. Rebecca, just to your reflections on this, how, how do you, if we are talking about a democratize, a more democratized process and a process that effectively dismantles the ways that we're used to seeing things, how, how do you deal with authority in that context? Um, I, th- I mean, I think personally, it, this is, it's a real challenge in terms of museum workers, I think, to interweave kind of different narratives. And that's what I was trying to put across in relation to the sort of Indian independence slide. You know, we were really, it's a very complex and nuanced history. Uh, and I, I, I felt that it was really important for us to to, to kind of work together as a, as a group to create and, and that, you know, there wasn't, I think we started off with the, with the notion maybe that the kind of curators would have the final say, but it, en- it ended up kind of flipping around completely and is changing the interpretation style and making a call on that. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with a lot of what Rachel says. I think it, it, it is a very difficult one. In the ideal world, you want to be able to come, and, it, come to an agreement with all of the parties to be able to come up with a text that, that everyone is is happy with, um, you know. But then I guess there's the other kind of you know question in relation to museums is your what you're presenting here is is um, an organisational stance as well as the kind of um, external curator stance on it, and that was a challenge in relation to TPIN as well. That you know, what what exactly are are we kind of presenting here, but. I mean, my kind of recollection of it is, and we certainly couldn't have done this without Sarah and Rachel's work, was that it was a collaboratively produced text that was that where, you know, as, as much as possible, where authority was shared. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, you know, it was a very a difficult process to get there. Mm. I mean, w- would it be fair to say to if you if, if the if the Birmingham Museum Trust was to uh, absolutely bring this kind of practice into its heart, it would then have to have a different starting point. So the concept of neutrality. So it's interesting with the Joseph Chamberlain. Uh, 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 the way that he was described, which to me in the, f- the first way was like it, it felt quite violent in its omissions of mm. exactly what um, that kind of genocide, you know, created, rippled out down the generations, where that wasn't included in the original one and then changed. Would you then have to have a position to say, no, we are starting from here. We are starting from our, our aim and our mission is to create a space that interrogates history and memory from this position of the decolonial, which means we don't want, we're not trying to be neutral. We're trying to have a standpoint. I mean, I would totally agree with what Rachel yeah. said, that there is no such thing as neutrality. Mm-hmm. Everything that you do, the way you live your life, the way you work, um, the way, you know, every aspect of your life is a representation of your lived experiences. Mm-hmm. And I, I, after this experience of TPIN, I would completely say that there is no, there is no neutrality, there is no neutral voice. Mm-hmm. And it's just a question of, you know, on that scale, I guess, wh- where you where you stand rather than mm-hmm. um, trying to be completely neutral. Mm, thank you. Um, Eleanor, I hope we've answered your questions about whether this has changed the approach to interpretation. So I'm going to skip on to the next question. Uh, Matthew asks, does decolonization in museums have to be filtered through local issues to be successful and accessible? Could the same be done in a national? So the idea that the Birmingham Museum is absolutely starting from its the, the stories within its local, its locale, its local communities. What happens if you were to try and scale that up? Rachel, I'm not sure if you may have perspective on that. Yeah, um, I mean, ideally, the nationals would um, would be able to to do this as well. I th- I don't think it necessarily needs to be local to be successful. Um, the issue around kind of national work on this is that it's a bigger audience it's a wider um and that the kind of question of neutrality and civic responsibility changes on a national level i I was interrogating this once when i was kind of frustrated that for example disney 
wasn't kind of providing the diversity and inclusion I wanted to see. I was, you know, kind of sad that, you know, you get one sort of diverse character, um, especially around the LGBTQ narratives, and it's like a suggestion. And I was like, oh, imagine the impact. Imagine the impact if Disney did this properly, if they just went all in and said, this is our characters and the rich stories from their perspective. And I know that lots of smaller animation studios and TV do this really well and they're human centered and they're gorgeous and they feel inclusive and you feel hugged. But the idea of, of something as big as the national or as Disney doing this wholeheartedly, the impact that would be, would be felt would be huge. And it would set a precedent that would mean that it would no longer be the first time this had ever been done. It was going to be a thing that we do now because we are in the moment. We have moved into the moment in time where the national story is diverse and critical. So I hope that it comes. Um, mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other layers in terms of responsibility and kind of that that streamlining of the narrative and selecting. So I think it would be it'd be interesting to also not aim necessarily for representation because that can also stop a lot of this work because you feel like you have to hit, tick every box and get everybody represented mm. and instead it's just focused more on um, multiplicity mm. and rich diverse human stories that we understand that because we live intersectional lives people would come at it and relate to it at different levels mm. and that we didn't have to necessarily represent everybody mm. thank you uh Question from Moira Lindsay, what happens with the co-curators and BMAG relationship when the project ends? So is there a kind of curatorial alumni for the, uh, for the external curators uh, that you hired, for example, for this? Um, and did some of the curators then shape other BMAG projects or mentor other new co-creators? So Rachel, you spoke a little bit about going on to do uh, another, curate another exhibition after this. What's, the, what's, the, what's your kind of relationship um, uh, Rebecca and Janine, how do you continue the relationship with the people that you work with outside of the organisation? I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Rebecca, but I think it just it varies a lot from from project to project. Um, you know, just thinking uh, my more recent project, the Don't Settle project. So some of the young people um, that we work with on that have. Um, Gone on to do sort of volunteering or get involved in other in other projects and programs, you know, uh, much broader than the reason why they initially engaged with us. It, it does very much depend on the individual really and whether they want to continue to 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 connect and work with work with us going forwards. Um, I, Rebecca, I don't know if you want to say anything about the particular co curators on the Past Is Now project. Um, we haven't worked with the, those co-curators again, um, but I think, you know, um, as Janine says, it, it kind of varies from project to project. And I think just because of the of the kind of challenges we face for the past is now that it's, um, you know, it's it's not been possible to work with those um, particular co-curators uh, again at this stage. Uh, just to say that... Um... Sarah Myers, who was one of the original co-curators from the past is now, she did sign up to be one of the collaborators for Within and Without the follow-up exhibition. She was unable to engage in the end because of personal issues, but there, there has been some of those, um, those opportunities. And actually each of the co-curators for the past is now have gone on to do quite a lot of really interesting, passionate projects that are not, whilst they're not with BMAG, they are not divorced from the past is now or the learning that we all went through together um, and they have very exciting kind of projects I mean Mariam Khan she was working on this during the during the the project as well but she, she's been one of the editors of the anthology it's um it's not about the burqa which is um quite a seminal piece uh Samaya Kasim went on to do a research fellowship in um with the museum of the world in Amsterdam um, in Amsterdam and um, Alia um, Hassan has done extraordinary curatorial projects across the country um, including a bald black girls exhibition in London that has again been repeated and picked up um, with mo in multiple ways and in influencing people in, in, in lots of different um, sites so yeah. 
from your point of view, Rachel, I've been on both sides of the coin. I've been inside institutions working with people outside, and I've been outside institutions working with people inside. Um, from your point of view, very quickly, what, what, what's ideal, I guess, if you're an external curator to have in terms of having a relationship with a cultural institution? Um, what, what, what's the kind of ideal conditions, uh, or are there ideal conditions that... Yeah, I am. So um, I think one of the biggest things that would be ideal and possibly one of the hardest things to do because of the systems and the timeframes that we work on is is transparency, because not everything will be like things that you agree upon. But a lot of people will understand if they can see how or why things are happening. But a lot of the times museums kind of obscure the decisions um, very few people would know that museums were struggling financially as an industry by looking at them unless they were engaged in it because all you do is you come into these beautiful perfect finished exhibition spaces you don't peek behind the curtain to see the offices you don't hear about the kind of fundraising you just sort of think they're asking for money <laughs> because they they want money um, and you you don't really see that you think or people do perceive it as this huge institution with lots of people with a lot of privilege and a lot of time to, to do a lot of work and if they understood that it was probably one person who was the team that you were engaging with and that their time was split across four or five projects um and then you can you could see transparently that that meant that actually all they had was one day per project at, at maximum mm. you would there would be a different kind of trust in a relationship but because we do kind of obscure the realities of some of the struggles, there is this level of um, distrust because there isn't a transparency. Um, and I think that's the ideal scenario I'd have is where it was like an honest engagement where you'd say, we want to work with you because we have this huge building and we have all of these, these things that people need access to. But honestly, we don't know enough and we don't have enough time to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what we need to work out is the administrative structure that gives you power and us like support and that's how we could work together. I think that's what I the hope, what would the ideal future be for me? Thank you. Right, I, I don't think we could be able to answer all of your questions, guys, I do apologize, but I think this one's quite interesting about audience. Uh, how important do you think it is for exhibitions with an intentionally political subject matter to inspire change in their audiences, change in attitude, understand, understanding actions, and is this should this be an intended outcome of such exhibitions? So I guess um, the past is now is a great example. When you're pulling something like this together and you're using this as an opportunity re to represent um, parts of uh, empire and the, and the colonial history, are you, is that, the, what are you hoping that the audience do with that? And I'll ask that of all of you actually. I guess uh, for me, the main memory that comes up for with this is that I distinctly remember a, a big discussion that we had with Sarah when we were designing this exhibition was that we didn't want, what we didn't want is for anybody white to come into the exhibition and then run away again because they were too, um, because they were, they were too kind of, I don't know, um, sort of shocked or feeling like they were being blamed or pointed, pointed a finger at uh, during this during the display and it was really important for us to come up with a concept and a framework where everybody could learn everybody could discuss and you know it was something that you know the very diverse communities in Birmingham could all sit in a sit in that space together and, and have those kind of discussions so I think it is hugely important especially given the kind of curriculum at the moment schools and universities that people can find spaces where they can learn and we know that people came into the exhibition and despite the fact that we were worried about the reading age of some of the panels that they took photographs of the panels and tweeted them and kind of learned from them and I, I, I feel very proud of this project that that, that was actually the case. Yeah. Apart from the um, Times journalist did any white people run away in horror? Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, we had, I mean, we had some upsetting comments where people would walk in and be like, oh, this is a black exhibition and turn around. Um, but that they were far, few and far between. I had a, a discussion with the director of the British Museum and he asked me, um, 
you know, what, what do you do? What do you do when people are critiquing it and people are also, um, you know, praising it at the same time? How do you how do you balance? And um, for me, it's not about quantity either, even though it was qu the quantity was was highly in favor of the positive reactions. But I think someone coming in saying, oh, this is I don't like this exhibition. I don't like how you phrase this academically. This challenges me. But also I just feel uncomfortable versus someone walking in and crying because they feel seen for the first time. Those do not equal each other to me. That being seen is such a powerful emotion that the quality of that interaction and the positive for that would make me weight that way higher than than the negative. Right. Okay. Thank you. Janine, what about yourself? What's, what's yeah, your... I think it's just, I mean, just building more on what Rebecca said at the beginning, I think it's just vitally important that people learn. I mean, given, you know, the, the how much the curriculum needs to change, I think, you know, some of the, the stories that were presented were potentially the first time that many of our visitors really kind of even begun to, to understand, you know, um, different perspectives on what they would... Um, you know, perhaps expect to see in a museum. And actually, I think what we've what we found since doing the passes now is that people have begun to question our other displays more and more. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's frustrating that we can't make the changes fast enough, really, across the rest of the museum. But you know, these things do take time. But um, you know, we do get complaints now about our other our other some of our other interpretations, some of the much older interpretation. In the museum, and I and I think you know, what what we do there is is try and invite people in to kind of help and work with us and support us to to make yeah. the changes that are needed elsewhere. I think that's a good thing. And very quickly, uh, going back to Rachel's point about we we often don't know how large institutions work. What what is making what why does it take so long to make those changes? If people are now asking for it, what's the mm. mechanism that needs to be speeded up to mm. make the change happen? I think it's uh, so much of it is down to funding and resource. So, you know, our funding levels are such that we can open the doors. Well, actually, we can't open the doors at the moment, clearly, because of the pandemic. But, you know, in an ordinary year, we can open the doors. You know, we have very little funding to actually make any changes to do the research that's required. And it, it is quite frustrating that so much of what we do, therefore, ends up being project based rather than core. And it's kind of how we make that shift when we don't necessarily have the resources in our core funding to do the work as part of our core activity. But I think it is, it is as somebody said at the beginning, is building that, building this approach into our, our strategy, our, our reason for being really as a charity um, is, is what's important. Um, right. Thank you very much. Well, um, it's it's going to be an interesting, uh, maybe in the year's time when uh, Sarah, Sarah Wajid and uh, uh, Zach are in pose, we can come back and, and get some more insight into that. But for now, thank you very much, uh, Janice, Janine Neeson, Rebecca Bridget, Bridgman and Rachel Minot for that insight. Really fascinating case study. Um, we're going to take a five minute break now for the rest of us so uh yeah take a walk around stretch your legs do what you need to do and we're going to start back at about 15 17 by my clock so um we'll see you back there then hi everybody welcome back uh right to part two of the workshop the seminar so this one, we're going to focus on three artistic interventions and provocations within and response to collections. We're now going to hear from Sarah Maple, who's prepared a short presentation, but she's unable to join us here in person. Father uh, Molodina and Keith Piper also. So we're going to come to Sarah's first uh, and hear her presentation. Uh, have, keep having a think of your questions. They were really rich. Thank you very much. So you can continue to post them throughout or just afterwards. So Sarah Maple's solo exhibition includes shows at the Untitled Space, New York, New Art Exchange and the Cobb Gallery. She was awarded the New Sensation Art Prize in 2007 and was recently commissioned new work by the Baltic uh, in, uh, and Sky Arts. Sarah will talk about a work commission for the Art 50 Festival, which took inspiration from the Past Is Now exhibition and is now part of the collection. 
Hi, I'm Sarah Maple. I'm a visual artist who works in very different mediums such as painting, photography, performance and video. And a lot of my work has reflected on my experience growing up in the UK with a mixed cultural background. And I use a lot of humour and satire in my work to make comments about identity politics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a painting that I made in response to The Past Is Now, which was a show about the British Empire and it's thanks to Birmingham which was at Birmingham Museum in 2017 to 18 and the painting is now part of the collection there. So I was raised in the south of England in the 90s which wasn't a very diverse area at the time and so throughout my life I've always been asked the where are you from question and people don't really know what they're getting themselves into when they ask me that question because it's not really a simple one-worded answer. It's not just a country, it's a complex answer that is rooted so deeply in the history of this country with colonization, empire, and I can't really answer that question without giving a short history lesson. So it's only really been in the past few years that I've really understood that fully myself. And actually, the more I've understood about my family history, the better I've been able to understand the Britain that we live in today. So I'm just gonna share some work here with you. And so this um, is what I'm starting with briefly here is a series I made about Brexit for an exhibition at New Art Exchange in Nottingham. And this one is called Send Them Back. And it's a series about Brexit. And when the referendum campaign was happening, I started observing the return of a lot of, quite frankly, retro racism and repetition of all these emotive phrases in the Leave campaign, such as send them back, control our borders, take back control, and I want my country back. Here's some examples of other pieces in the series here. And I was interested in how these phrases sort of mean nothing really, but they're so effective. So I made this series where I took quintessentially British things and combined them with this um, negative emotive language to see what legacy this period is leaving behind for Britain. And this whole period really struck a chord with me because for me, there was a fundamental ignorance and misunderstanding about what Britain is and how we've got here. And when my family moved to Birmingham from Kenya in the 60s, people would say, you know, go back to where you came from, which to me has always been ironic because they were only there in the first place because of the repercussions of the empire that had forced them out of their homeland. And regardless of that, whether they were here or still in Kenya, they were still British subjects as they were born into a country under the British empire, under British rule. So what Brexit highlighted for me is a lack of understanding and education about our colonial past. And that means that many people do not really understand the multicultural country that we are currently living in. So in 2018, I was commissioned by Sky Arts who were making a festival called Art 50, which was reflecting on our national identity in light of Brexit. And when I heard about an empire show at Birmingham called The Past Is Now, it resonated so much with the thoughts I've been having over the past two years since the referendum and I had to get to the show. Here's a picture here from um, the show. And the show is really fascinating and not only in the content itself, but with the complex conversations that arose from it about how we decolonize museums. But in the show itself, I found out a lot I didn't know about Birmingham and the direct link to empire in many different ways, such as manufacturing. And there is a particular section on capitalism and how Birmingham was one of the manufacturing centers of the empire. And how this impacted so positively on Birmingham and made it such a prosperous city, but in turn deliberately exploiting and underdeveloping colonies. And it went on to explain how modern day migration is the direct consequence of a colonial past and how this is often forgotten by Britain's inhabitants. Then they have this quote here, we're here because you were there. And it really got me thinking how I can incorporate this into a painting that reflected my own history. And at the same time, talk about empire. So here's a, another image of mine here from some of my early work. Um, so here there was a section in the show and representation, which again really resonated with me, but on a different level. As the text read, if you aren't racialized as white, it can be difficult to see yourself fairly represented in popular culture, media and government policy and for me representation as what I actually am 
was never really going to happen because I'm a mixed race British Asian Muslim woman who is sort of accepted as white and adapted to that and so is a privilege of a white person but with a completely different cultural upbringing and so that has informed a lot of my work about British identity and I'm just going to read a section from the text here it read, during the British Empire, artists created works which helped to create a fantasy version of what the colonies were like. The colonised people were represented by the colonisers for a white European audience. Images of colonised people often shown as unclothed and uncivilised reinforced ideas of them as subhuman. And in fact, when the public started to question the empire, a board called the Empire Marketing Board was created by the government where they employed artists to create these fantasy images of empire with willing subjects to try to persuade the public that this empire was great and they should buy goods that benefited everyone with, within it. But in reality, the inhabitants of those countries were suffering hugely. So to continue with the text from the show, today racist stereotypes of diaspora communities as threatening or dangerous echo these exoticized images in historical art collections. How people are represented in popular culture changes how society feels about them. Black and Asian artists use art as a tool to resist, explore and challenge questions of representation. So here's a couple of images of my work here and with the title of the show, The Past Is Now, you can look at that again in a new context as you can really see how the long-term effect of this plays out and how it plays out today. And we've seen this recently with Black Lives Matter. And for me, 9-11 had a really big impact on me as a British Muslim, as you could see things starting to turn around that time and the other ring, the depiction of all Muslims as terrorists and potential threats. And you still see it now in popular culture, even with Boris Johnson openly referring to women in burqas as letterboxes and becoming prime minister without having to apologize for that. So a lot of my work responded to, to butting against the representation of Muslims. And for me, one of the strongest, some of the strongest art out there are artists who are taking back ownership of their identities and challenging preconceptions and creating new and empowering images. And I think what the show did well is that it showed that to understand our identity today, we need to understand the part, the part Britain has played globally, especially our colonial past and how the wealth gained has formed the foundations of modern Britain. I think if we fail to understand the complex factors that have contributed to modern Britain, this is where it sows doubt as to who gets to call it home. So this is, uh, finally I'll get around to showing you the painting that I made, which is called The Past Is Now, and which is a direct response to the exhibition. And here is a picture here for scale, and it was produced for the Art 50 Festival and exhibited at the Baltic. And here's a little close up one for you. And the reason I didn't answer the where are you from question earlier is because I thought I would let the painting do the talking. And here you can see I've done this large painting where I borrowed the style from the Empire Marketing Board to tell the story of Britain today and how Britain is not just one thing. And the Empire's legacy is a huge cultural mix in this country. And as you can see on my mum's side of the painting, there's the Indian, Pakistan and Kenyan flags. And my grandparents on my mum's side are from the Punjab region of India, who then went to Pakistan after partition. And then like many people from that time ended up in Kenya working for the British on the railways. So my mum was actually born in Kenya um, and was there with her siblings till she was about 10 or 11. And then when it became difficult for Indians live, to live in Kenya, they then came over to the UK. And my dad's background is basically British. So at the bottom next to the now text I've painted in one of my own photographs which is called White Girl where I looked at my hybrid heritage and on the other side I included an ethnic diversity form because for years I've never really known what to tick and it's always a bit of a minefield and I'm always humming and ahhing trying to find the exact definition which I'm sure is many people in this country have the same problem. And here um, there's two circles at the bottom of the painting and I have an image here of people fleeing India as my grandparents did when they were children at the time um, in, during partition and they went through a horrendous journey and nearly killed as they tried to go over to Pakistan um, from India and here is an image of 
two British men in India with an Indian servant standing there fanning them and I found this image in a book and I found it so odd and awful and I was really taken by the look on the boy's face in the picture I couldn't stop looking at it and it's it's part of our history and it's weird for me to think that I'm sort of biologically and culturally made up of both parts of this image and so here are portraits of myself my dad and my mother and in fact my father passed away suddenly the day after i took the photo for this painting so the painting had further significance for me as i worked on it and my parents actually met and married in birmingham so as well as being hugely inspired by the past is now exhibition it feels really fitting and beautiful ending for this work to be in the collection at birmingham museum so um, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but if anyone would like to follow up with me or ask any questions at all, you can contact me um, at ceramicproductgmail.com. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, but if there's still, if there's any questions that respond to, um, Sarah's uh, presentation, then that's great. You know, keep, keep them coming. So next we're gonna to go to Far, Farwa Maladina, who's worked in numerous galleries in the West Midlands, including Birmingham Muse, Museum and Art Gallery, the Midlands Art Center, Icon Gallery, and New Art Gallery, Warsaw. In 2020, she exhibited at the Lahore Biennale and showed at Grand Union Gallery in Birmingham. She's currently shown work at the Herbert Museum and Art Gallery in the exhibition 13 Ways of Looking. Farwa will talk about her work, Not Your Fantasy, which has also been acquired by the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery for their collection. Hello, my name is Farwa Maladina. I'm a Muslim artist interested in feminism, Muslim women and faith. I often explore these themes through the use of pattern and textile. My interest in textiles was sparked through a study of Orientalism um, and the Orientalist depictions of harems and women's spaces as inherently erotic. The decadent interiors found within these works led me to begin exploring the deconstruction of such Orientalist tropes and the colonial logic behind them. I use um, patterns and textile to directly respond to Orientalist artworks by using elements of existing artworks within the patterns I make and I always refer to Islamic design principles when making my patterns. In this presentation, I will focus mainly on my work concerned with reclaiming the Orientalist narrative surrounding Muslim women. I'll start off by explaining why I use textile as a medium. Um, I work with textiles for a number of reasons. Textile has evolved from being a traditionally utilitarian craft concerned with the domestic to being reclaimed by women artists. Um, and I've always been interested in these quote unquote traditional crafts. I was taught to crochet by my aunt when I was about 10 years old um, and I often used weaving techniques to make bracelets as a child. I even had a little pink table loom. Um, and so this form of making has always been such a big part of my identity. And that's why I felt that these sort of digital patterns um, were appropriate because it was a way for me to create these contemporary reflections of traditional practices within my work. Um, and the use of modern techniques allows for a more contextualized textile with the inclusion of figures and different elements compared to if I was working purely with yarn. Um, the repetition involved in working with yarn is then translated into working digitally when I make my patterns um, and this allows for a bridge between the traditional techniques and my contemporary responses. Before I begin talking through specific pieces, I think it's important to give a brief introduction into Islamic art and the Islamic design concepts that I use when working on my patterns. Um, Not Your Harem Girl was designed using elements of Ong's Le Grand Odalisque, which has been criticised for its appropriation and sexualization of Eastern culture. The pattern includes a scanned image of an embroidery I made with the words Not Your Harem Girl, and also an image of a hand with a henna design I made from the same text. 
Um, I work in layers, so I create embroidery and henna and text that then feature in the work. And when combined, these different elements form patterns that resemble Islamic geometric art. Um, Islamic art is fundamentally based on the concept of Tawheed, which means divine unity. And this is expressed through geometric symmetrical patterns that appear to be infinite. Designs attempt to trace the origins in creation, encouraging viewers to reflect th upon them inwards. And so Islamic art promotes self-reflection and an exploration of what lies beneath the visual surface. My piece, Not Your Harem Girl, interprets these concepts within a critique of Orientalist caricatures. Central to the success of the Orientalist movement was the bastardization of inherently Islamic iconography and the Muslim female form. Um, and so responding to and reappropriating Orientalist art is an inherently decolonial practice. Um, Not Your Harem Girl is composed of a symmetrical geometric repeat pattern. The pattern is made from a myriad of elements, as I mentioned earlier, which are not immediately perceptible. The pattern needs to be studied and contemplated to perceive its hidden depths, which is inspired by Islamic art and the exploration of what lies beneath the immediate visual surface. This then invites the viewer to identify the different layers within the pattern and reflect on 19th century Orientalism and its prevalence in current society. The process of creating a pattern is also a form of reflection for me, um, always bringing me back to the concept of Tawhid and through the reclamation of um, Islamic design. Um, Not Your Harem Girl was then used as um, a base for a couple of other series. Um, it was initially used in my Not Your Fantasy series, which was made um, at the same time as Not Your Harem Girl. Not Your Fantasy is a series of textile prints concerned with reappropriating and reclaiming Orientalist imagery of Muslim women. The work is a sublimation print on polyester. Uh, the use of sublimation printing on fabric allows for a bridge between modern photography and 19th century painting. The work is composed of a Muslim woman clad in white, set within a white background. Um, the lack of colour is crucial, as it negates all exotic and erotic orientalist stereotypes. Uh, the only element of colour within the piece is the Not Your Harem Girl fabric. Um, and the work is embroidered with the words Not Your Fantasy, which we saw on the previous slide. Um, the fabric printed on fabric results in a pale and imprecise reproduction of the original photograph. This creates notions of figuratively pale reproductions of Muslim women within Orientalist paintings. This helps to articulate my concern with the cultural construction and visual mediation of the Orient. Um, the phrase, not your fantasy, is challenging and clearly directed at 19th century Orientalist painters who created scenes of harems from their imagination and were fascinated by the otherness of the Eastern woman. To reinforce this, the woman's gaze is challenging in opposition to the vapid expressions of women in Orientalist paintings. And Not Your Harem Girl was then used within another series of work I made in 2019. The series comprises two pieces, titled No One Is Neutral Here and You Must Choose Your Part In The End. The titles for both pieces are taken directly from the poetry of late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, from the poem I Have A Seat In The Abandoned Theatre. These works are a series of digital prints on polyester. In these, an anonymous woman is photographed, wrapped in the Not Your Harem Girl fabric. No one is neutral here and you must choose your part in the end are photographed at the Hagia Sophia in Turkey, although that isn't made obvious. 
I have attempted to negate the exotic that is often associated with the East by steering away from the elaborate mosaic tiles and domes and stereotypical otherness that we are often identified with. Even though the location is not evident, I felt it was important to take the Nacho Haram girl fabric to Turkey to photograph and place the woman within what is considered to be an intellectual space. The two images are taken beside a column and beside a window. When paired, they speak of enduring gender politics, both past and present, whilst also challenging the West's voyeuristic view of Muslim and Eastern women. Um, I've also tried to put a greater emphasis on the textile over the architecture and this defies traditional art historical hierarchies and works to reclaim and re-establish textile as an art form. The use of Mahmoud Darwish's poetry as the titles works to bring to a Western audience um, an awareness of the literary and artistic talent within the Middle East the poem is significant also because it explores authorship by inviting the spectator to become the author. This prompts viewers to question their role as spectators and whether we are neutral or biased, um, which leads viewers to question the prevalence of Orientalist thought in contemporary society. Going forward, I would like to keep making artwork that creates um, more nuanced debate regarding female Muslim identity in contemporary art. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Farwa. Uh, now we're going to come to Keith Piper. Keith currently works in the Fine Art Department at Middlesex University. His creative practice responds to specific social and political issues, historical relationships and geographical sites. Adopting a research-driven approach and using a variety of media, Keith's work has ranged from painting through photography and installation to use of digital media, video, and computer-based interactivity. Keith's gonna talk about the ghosts of Christendom from 1991, the remaining fragment of a now lost body of work, and the circumstances surrounding the creation, display, loss, and selective preservation of works in collections. I really, um, like to kind of thank this project for inviting me because this has been such a fascinating um, afternoon to revisit this particular show and to kind of hear about the context of its framing of its curation etc etc it's a whole range of really fascinating questions plus I've been really encouraged by um, the work of, of um, Sarah and, 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 and um, far, far, far well. Um, in terms of just taking up these really complex issues. However, I want to go back and speak a bit about this past is now exhibition, um, just um, um, from the point of view of a participant, because um, I had two works in this show. Um, this piece here, I hope you can see my uh, mouse, um, which is the um, cross type piece, which is the AM um, Ghost of Christendom. And this, and this work here, which is, um, um, called An English Queen. And both of those, those have found their way into the collection at Burnbrook, uh, I mean, I just wanted to kind of speak a bit about that process and also about the role of, of the museum um, collection as custodian of, of these objects, because these objects are, are kind of very much fragments of an earlier, lot larger work. Um, another view. Um, the, the, the earlier larger work was um, from an exhibition called A Ship Called Jesus, which happened um, at the Icon in Birmingham in, in, in 1991. Now, as a show, I am actually um, quite amazed by how much, how much contextual material was generated through this there. Some show there was a publication, which was quite rare, which has um, a kind of in-depth essay um, looking or, or um, deconstructing histories of the relationship between the Christian church and people of African descent, using this opening image of the slave ship, um, the, um, Jesus of Lubeck, as our opening, as the opening um, relationship in terms of our relationship with Christianity. And so therefore, as this 
enduring meta anthropos. There is an in-depth essay about this particular project, which is now on on my IA website, if you want to go and read it. And also um, in depth around um, this particular Gallagher regard. Um, in terms of the show itself, it was it was divided into three sections. Um, the opening sex action was this installation called The Ghost of Christendom, which was all these objects um, on the wall. And, uh, and then this is the remaining object, which is the which is the, the AM cross. Everything else in this image has been lost. Everything else, you know, through, you know, being lost in um, in storage rooms, getting wet, um, the AM, AM fragility of the images themselves have meant that they have faded and so and so were thrown away. So this is all that that re remains. And it, it remains because it was taken in um, to the to the collection in Birmingham, who kind of had the resources to kind of um, keep the work, look after the work. The work is extremely. Keith, can you hear? I wonder if you can hear me, Keith. Your mic, your headphones, and your mic is uh, there's some interference on it. So, so and so this is better. Much better, thank you. Okay, so I do apologize to everybody. We did have a sound check earlier. I said it was fine, but who knows? Anyway, so, um, and so also, oh, well, and also these are, these works here, which was a pirate and English queen on a ship called Jesus. This is this kind of trip etich of uh, open panels, which was about the, the relationship between John Hawkins as the captain of the first English slave ship, um, Queen Elizabeth I, who heard and sponsored that ship and the ship itself, the ship called Jesus. And so this very, very much was a triptych of other uh, the panels. However, uh, once again, you know, the panels were lost, they were damaged, you know, various things happened to them. And at one point, I realized that all I had left intact was the, the English Queen. And so at that stage, you know, rock the that and also lose that, I, I, I am got in touch with the Birmingham, uh, asked them if they were interested in this work, and they acquisitioned that as well. They, they took that into their collection, and, and thank goodness now, it's kind of safe, it's stabilised, it's still around. The, the kind of, and, and, and in that particular work was the first was the first installation in a larger piece. And the main installation was this, which was called the um, Rites of Facids. It was a large, it was a large pool of water in the gallery space, constantly rippling with, um, with multiple slide projections um, projected onto the wall and off the water with a soundtrack. And it's all about the kind of rites of transition and migration and, and, and water as a metaphor. Uh, um, that work, you know, was um, uh, was the kind of first was the first version of of these objects of the uh, um, ghost of Christmas and them. And uh, and then later that year, I did another version of that show at the Camden Art Centre in November, December, nineteen ninety one. And by that time. Um, those objects, the Ghost of Crispy, Essendon piece, have, have, have morphed into a light box. So there's now this kind of light box version, you know, using the same visual, visual metaphor, but extended somewhat and made as a light box. And the, the other um, um, panels likewise were also made in, in, into light boxes. And so this idea of the fragment which sits in in the museum collection is also the first iteration of, of an idea which was then re, re made in lightbox form and, and went to various places. This is when, when um, the work was actually shown in this very strange, in this very strange castle in, in Germany, this really you know, oblique castle, castle and the you know, light, light box was, was displayed in this way. Um, just to finish, I'm just going to play um, another 
revisiting of this idea, which happened um, when, I, when I attempted to kind of revisit a range of my works in a project within the called, called um, Relocating the Remains. I'll just play this. Hopefully there's going to be sound. Okay. Fingers crossed. There's sound. Can you hear? I do apologize about the, the headset thing. That's, that's fine, Keith. Thank you. That was really rich, both of you and Farwa. So thank you so much. What I'm going to do again is to give us all a bit of time to process both all of those three presentations. So maybe if we can take a minute, if you've got questions, you can put them in the Q&A uh, box. Um, we've got some time. We're going to have about 15 minutes to talk to both Keith and Farwa. So any questions? Keith, Farwa, think of some for each other. I definitely have some for you. Um, but we're just going to take a minute just to think of some questions and we'll, we'll start the Q&A. Yes, I think we're back. So... Um, why I want to thank you guys in terms of the work that you presented is because there's a question actually that Rachel 
uh, Minot posed in a, her article about the Past is Now exhibition, which I think is probably the fundamental question, which is, can you actually decolonize something that, that came from a colonized moment? that grow out of that. And both of you speak about reappropriation, reappropri reclamation, revisiting in your work. So I'd like to throw that question back to both of you about your, your thoughts on, can you decolonize something that began in a colonized state? Talk to either one of you. Um, do you want to go ahead? No, no, I wanted you to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, um, I'm always fascinated by I am this as a question. And um, in a sense, I haven't been someone who's actually used the term decolonization within, within you know, my ideas and my, and my prep rap act is not because I'm, I'm in any way hostile to it as an impulse. And, mm -hmm. and I very much am about the kind of, um, the kind of scrutiny of history, the uncovering of other narratives, you know, the bringing together of evidence and, you know, uncovered histories and all that. Absolutely, that has been um, a key part of my, of my position for, for kind of decades. Um, I'm slightly nervous by the term, you know, simply because I realise that, um, you know, my entire position, my being, my whatever, is the result of a series of colonial uh, moments. You know, the fact that I'm called Keith Piper, and I had this Scottish name, even though, you know, I'm clearly not Scottish, all those kind of things. And that becomes a really important thing that I don't necessarily, um, I don't think I can unravel those things. But I think that through research, et cetera, et cetera, we understand its complexities. We think about more and more it as this kind of you know thing which we have to read and read those those multiple stories within that. So in that sense, um, I'm actually I won't say that I'm a fan of the museum as such, but I am a fan or I am in, enthusiastic about the idea of an institution which holds objects, holds objects and has them accessible to the public through whatever means, but holds and looks after objects for, for um, various generations of historians to look at and think around and research around. Now, if you call that a museum, you can call it a museum, you can call it, you know, but I do think that that particular, um, that particular function is an important one. Um, and I do think also um, it needs to be an agnostic, in a sense, an agnostic looking after of objects. You know, I will look up, you know, I, you know, it's not a looking after objects which is contingent on us necessarily agreeing with the worldview of the people that made them. Because in a sense, I want, I want to hold those objects. And so I can understand more about the worldview of the people that made them, even though it's radically different to mine. I think that's an also a really important role of the museum. That's yeah. this act of this act of looking after of custodianship is actually agnostic. Is that the right word? Mm. What's the word I'm going to use? In it? I think it's a good word because in, in another way, potentially it's neutral by another name. You know, we've been talking mm. a lot about this concept of neutrality. No, is it not the same? Come I on. I don't think it's the same. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You, No, 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 no. I'm sorry. It is the same. That's just my, my no, no, contrary no, no, no. I'm, I'm, no, 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 I'm really... It is the same. Neutrality and yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's that it's... idea that we look after the object and then, right. you know, other people can come and, you know, and give value judgments or whatever. Yes. And yeah. read stuff into the object and read, you know, stories and histories and all those kinds of things. And those stories and histories will change. Yeah. You know, the stories in 20 years' time will be different to the stories now. Yeah. Over, I think that's... Farwa, what, what, what's your perspective on this? First of all, can, uh, can you can you decolonize something that began from a colonized state? What's your perspective on that as a statement? Um, I think decolonizing is such a, it's, it's such a vast term, like there's so much it encompasses. Um, and it's, it's 
difficult work and it's important work and it's a huge responsibility. Um, and I think I'm not I'm not quite sure. I think it's um, I think what Keith said about uncovering that's um, I think that's a huge part of a decolonial practice is uncovering and um, bringing that truth to light and bringing the violence to light of this sort of you know um, of colonization of of you know how you were mentioning about um, taking care of objects um, but then having conversations about why we have those objects oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, how they came about um, you know there's so much violence rooted in that and I think by attempting to, to decolonize a collection or having a decolonial practice I think um, is bringing these questions to light and trying to uh, be responsible and um, inform audiences. I'm not sure, I don't think it can ever take away the violence that is um, so sort of inherent in, in colonization and having sort of um, collections through, through um, empire and through colonization, it doesn't take away any of that history so I'm not sure it it uncolonizes them like I'm not quite sure it does that but I think it's important and it is it is um a step forward I'm not sure I'm not I don't think it it can take away from the context of when the works were sort of made or taken um but it is a step in the direction of, of making people aware and making ourselves aware and taking responsibility. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. And I just want to come back to Keith, your agnostic versus neutral. Hilary Robinson says, maybe this will help us. I think agnostic is less about being neutral and more about not having certainty. Hmm. Um, yes, because it, I suppose the term agnostic itself comes from a kind of um, an attitude to the idea of a deity, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's like, like not being so fair. So, um, in a sense, I think, yeah, yeah, it is a confusing um, word to use. Mm. So I should actually go back to my, to my term about being neutral. Mm. About mm. the, but I think, I think that one made a really essential point that um, we do also have to consider the, the kind of route which objects took into the museum. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, we've spoken about, you know, we've just had, had kind of three presentations from artists who have work in the museum, yeah. you know, and that work has gone into the museum through, you know, a very clear, clear choice on the part of the artist yeah. and other objects have been accessed in other ways but obviously we're also having this incredible conversation about you know objects which were which are now in in museums as a result of looting and pillage so mm. therefore how do we rethink how do we mm. and and to have those objects there as a way of reminding us of that story is mm. also quite important but then what do we do next with that Yes. And, and let's talk about let's talk about your journey in terms of your own pieces, your journey into the, the to BMAG, um, because, you know, it, that's also this. I keep going back to this idea that we don't actually know how things actually work when you're outside of the process. So how, how does a piece, so to, maybe Keith, I'd be interested in both of yours, but to talk about the fragment of the piece that was left that, you know, thank the Lord, um, BMAG took on. How, how did that happen, literally? I've been trying to remember in terms of the initial piece, the, the in Ghost of Christmas, yeah, it's in the piece. I can't remember, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> I was like thinking, how did that, or mm. when did they, when did they take that piece or how, or whatever. I was just aware that um, they did some really interesting things with it off afterwards. So I remember um, it was at the center of a kind of youth group performative thing where they had some young people responding to that work. I thought that was a, a kind of really rich way of kind of using an object which is in their collection. Mm. Um, as I say, the um, the English Queen work was just, you no, know, I put it to, to them because it was that or the skip. Right. And, and right. they came and took I, it. Which and they good. said, yeah, they'll take it. <laughs> Fawa, what about yourself? How did, how did your piece end up 
in the in the collection um my not your fantasy yeah. series was part of my degree show work um at the birmingham school of art two years ago summer 2018 and um one of vmag's uh curators of modern contemporary art i believe emily beddows um came to our degree show and she just she liked the work and she reached out which was really really lovely of her mm. um and she uh emailed me asking if i would like to show it at the women power protest exhibition um that took place in december 2018 i believe mm-hmm. um it was an arts council collection exhibition and you know absolutely like i was really happy with that um and it just sort of went from there um mm. it was shown at that exhibition and then there were talks of acquiring it and they did acquire it and yeah it was it was just a really lovely mm. thing to happen straight out of uni so i was mm. really pleased and, and kind of shows the power and importance of, of you know, we, we talk often about the institution, the historic institution as a place in which we must grapple with, because like you're saying, it comes from, it's born out of a particular moment, but actually it's continued importance as, as Keith says, as a way to kind of um, preserve uh, contemporary memory is also important to remember. I'm interested in this, it's a really kind of open eyed, open-ended idea and I'm, for yourselves, for the audience, um, about collection. Is collection a colonial practice? So going back to the Black Panther moment, you know, when Eric Kilmunga walks in and speaks about, you know, kills the curator and takes back the concept of restitution, that lots of these, lots of these objects, most of them, many of them were, were, were stolen and looted. Um, so the concept of collection, memory gathering, is that specific and an important part of the kind of empire mentality, do you think? I think it's embedded into that mentality, but I think that kind of, um, um, we have to make a separation between, between collection, which is based on exchange, and collection, which is based on a kind of, you know, <laughs> which is based on gifting or purchase or all of those kind of things which have been really central to the evolution of human societies. We've, we've, we've exchanged things with each other, we've, we've bartered, we've done all those kind of things. And you can, you can collect and maybe collecting in that sense, you know, building up a whole, you know, <laughs> archive of stuff is something which is kind of quite important to us as people. Mm. Obviously, when we actually then look at a collection which is based on theft. Mm. Obviously, then you're talking about a whole whole different thing. Mm. Or, you know, which or collections which come out of this kind of act of violence. Mm. We're talking about yeah. something different. But I think that idea of accumulation. I mean, mm. I love collecting things. I collect things all the time. Mm. You don't want to mm. see the rest of this room because it's so <laughs> full of all kinds of strange things. So collecting is important, I think. Mm. Well, what do you think? I, I agree, and I think as long as it's sort of done responsibly, um, mm. like Keith was saying, it's a whole different story when you talk about um, theft and, you know, museum collections that are based on looting. Mm. Um, you know, but um, I guess contemporary collections, if, if that's a thing, is a, is a whole other thing, as long as it's done sort of responsibly and with, um respect towards the artist because i think that's so important is when you collect pieces because you think you know that they're primitive and we want to show that to to our sort of white audiences versus when you collect a work because you have respect for that maker and for their lived experiences and for what they're trying to portray in their work um they're very different and i think um that's reflected in the way that that work is then um, interpreted within galleries and museums is, is displayed. Um, and yeah, I um... and, and, on, and on that, a quick, a quick sort of final question to both of you, Father, or maybe to start with yourself is um, from an artist's point of view, from, from a maker's point of view, what do you need from museums and art galleries? If you could have a request, what, what is oh. it? That, <laughs> yeah. Um, difficult question. Mm. Um, I think a sense of um, 
itself and stance and history, which is some which is what we're doing through this is you know having these conversations um supporting our communities so with um you know be my curators coming to to degree shows that opens doors for young um artists it's 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 made a huge difference in my career and you know that's thanks to uh be mag's interest in their community you know mm. ha um community is so important I think um, for galleries and for museums um, to cater to uh, the population that is you know that you are servicing because it, it's a service essentially I think that museums mm. and galleries provide. Mm. Um, I have experience working in a gallery I, I worked as a learning coordinator at Icon Gallery um, for a year and a half and it's um, it's a responsibility to 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 provide for our communities and I think having that at the forefront mm. of everything museums and galleries do um, but also you know with museums it's a little bit more complicated in that you have to again sort of be responsible of what you show and how you interpret it and um, just ha keep having these conversations you know it's um, it's really important and it's a, it's just constant learning Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Padua. Keith, for you, what, what's at this stage in your venerable career, what, oh, <laughs> what's your, what's your, what do, what's advice, what advice or what you, what is your need, I guess? What are my needs? Mm. Um, they're, they're kind of multiple and I agree with everything with HFR, huh? what I said. Um, all of that is mm. essential. I mean, um, the other need which I, which I have is just the need to be able to go in there and be inspired or you know be exposed to things which may you know influence my thinking or send me in a different um, research direction or whatever and so it's having a range of objects in a museum which are accessible which i can then go in and become the starting point for other things and then and for that yes they need a collection they need a collection which is proper properly displayed, which is contextualized in a way which begins to give me an understanding of how that object arrived there and what the object is, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all, it's just that as the kind of, as a kind of start point for, you know, a set of processes. Mm. I think that is really important for me. And that's why, you know, when I travel, I go and always go, I'll always go and visit the museum and wherever and, you know, whatever it is, you know, mm. it's full of bones, I'll still go. Mm. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith Piper uh, and Farwa Maladina. I'm just now going to pass back to... Thank you. Thank you, Gaylene. Um, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to be coherent as I can over the next few minutes to try to draw out some of the... Um, incredible array of uh, rich and important uh, points of discussion and also to pick up on uh, some uh, themes and questions from the previous seminars. Um, Janine mentioned uh, a, a quote um, at the beginning early on um, which, which referred to a shift from the question of what we should put in the museum um, to the question of who we should put in the museum. And Rachel drew attention to the need to address how this might be done. That is, on what terms, with what support or lack of, uh, with what responsibilities or lack of, what power or lack of. And the question of who uh, this we is, who constitutes the non-neutral, never neutral decision-making we um, hanging over the question of how. I think it's really significant to hear such agreement on the impossibility of neutrality um, and encouraging to hear that if transparency was uh, lacking or insufficient at the beginning of the passes now, ongoing reflections on the project's uh, failings come successes seem to have impacted directly on various practices and projects after. Um, 
transparency, not only in terms of how decisions may be made or may appear to be made behind closed doors, but also transparency in how the emotional and critical labor of others are acknowledged and remunerated fairly or otherwise. Um, both Rebecca and Rachel referred to the doing, um, nothing can replace the doing, um, actions are um, as important or need to come with the words. Um, and, and Rachel underscored the need to continually evolve, reflect and adapt decolonial thinking in context through lived experience and working practices. Um, one size does not fit all. There's a lot of talk of toolkits, people wanting toolkits. And um, there's no off the shelf, I would say, there isn't an off the shelf solution to the problems and challenges facing institutions. Um, I really appreciated the, the observation that we have to get better at recognizing decolonial practice, even when it's not labeled as such, um, to recognize the multiplicity, multivocality and intersectionality of approach as fundamental to a human centered, not white centered way or ways of being in the world, ways of seeing, hearing and experiencing the world that's essentially subject driven, not object driven, centering people, not things and acknowledging pain, history and trauma. Um, and also an openness to unexpected connections which may be beautiful as well as nuanced. Um, it was really important to hear Keith and, and Farah's reflections on, um, for me, it, it felt like a lot of the conversation actually actually was around care and carelessness, um, the um, inadvertent or risks of um, or displays of um, that, um, that both um, have experienced. Um, Keith mentioned, referred to the museum collection as, as custodians, um, of the, the objects, the fragments of an of earlier vast project, which has so sadly been, been lost. And Farrell talked about the need for respect um, for artists um, to, to nurture and sustain a sense of self um, through support, through the provision of history context. And, and he added the access to things, accessibility to, to things um, that not only drive a practice, but affirm one sense of self in the world. Um, so we return to questions of time and care, which, uh, which came up in um, the, the first couple of seminars, and the question um, of how these extend beyond the relationships um, established through formal transactions or exchanges um, or acquisitions between um, made by museums and individuals. Um, there was a brief discussion of the relationships um, with the co-curators from the past is now following a question from the audience on, on, on how these, um, if they had been sustained at all, and it sounded like there's a lot of um, uh, voluntary, informal, ongoing work being done. I wonder whether in light of unequal relations of power, un ongoing unequal relations and heightened precarity um, for artists and curators in the current climate, I wonder whether there are more formal ways in which institutions can ward against neglect, uh, neglect of objects and people to nurture and sustain those on whom uh, their futures rely. So I'm gonna stop there and, and, and move on to thanking all our speakers today um, and our audience for staying with us. Um, uh, Gaylene, of course, for wonderful moderating. I also want to thank our colleagues at uh, UAL, Claire Pattenden, the Institute Manager, and Tom and Georgina um, from the Creative Computing Institute, um, and of course, the British Art Network for making this seminar series possible. And uh, we do hope to see some of you back here tomorrow for our fourth and final seminar. Um, if, if you could also take a moment to uh, pop your feedback uh, in, in the Q&A, that would be great. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>